Hello there, I'm Fintusius and today we'll be reviewing the state of the Frost Death Knight in Shadowlands. After living mostly in the shadow of the unholy spoken BFA, let us dive into what awaits us in this upcoming death themed expansion. All is not lost. Not yet. Crazy thing is, it's true. All of it. Yes, yes, everything you've heard is true. Frost Death Knights can now once again use two handers as their weapon of choice as well as dual wielding. I would say it's up to you to decide which one you prefer, but those choices come with some balance changes that we'll get to later because let me stop you right there, as I'll start by showcasing you that both Obliterate and Frost Strike received some pretty sexy new animations. This is Obliterate, and that's Frost Strike. Obliterate, Frost Strike. You get the picture. It looks and feels very satisfying to press, especially since it actually does damage when using a two-hander, but we'll get to that. Now back to the core changes. While Frost Death Knights didn't get changed much at a first glance, the things that did get iterated on will surely create a refreshing take on the Frost specialization, so let's dive into details. Two BFA PvP talents have been granted baseline to all Death Knights. The first one is Anti-Magic Zone, which spawns a magical barrier that reduces spell damage taken by 20% for 10 seconds while inside it on a 2 minute cooldown. For some reason, the tooltip still hasn't been updated on the beta, so I'll just mention that it has the added bonus of granting you a raid spot. There's also a new PvP talent that increases the damage reduction to 60%, so just like it was in BFA PvP. The next one is Lichborn, also on a 2 minute cooldown with a 10 second duration which is yet another defensive ability for DKs. When used, it transforms you into an undead which grants you 10% leech as well as immunity to charm, fear and sleep, so it's basically like a Red Bull overdose. Next up we have Death Coil, which is a... Uh, well, uh, here I guess. You can use it as a desperate attempt to finish off that druid that is running away at 5% HP or to hit the boss while being very far away, but it's not worth the runic power most of the time so avoid using it unless very necessary. In the same category of being here just for the sake of it is Death and Decay, which is now baseline but has no interaction with the frost specialization and doesn't do a whole lot of damage, but since it's uncapped in terms of AoE targets, you might want to use it in some AoE pulls even though it will just tickle your enemies over 10 seconds. The best usage of it will surely be getting rogues and druids out of south in arenas. Following that we have Raise Dead, which summons a ghoul for 1 minute on a 2 minute cooldown that you cannot control like in the unholy spec, does little to no damage and is only really here to enable the usage of Sacrificial Pact, which is going to be both a defensive ability because it heals you for 25% of your max HP but requires 2 GCDs to do so, or an AoE small burst. At the moment it doesn't do an enormous amount of damage for Frost DKs but it's likely still worth using the globals in an AoE pull for the damage explosion to up to 8 targets. Targets. Now let's get to juicier parts. Legion Frost Death Knights, rejoice, because Frost Wimps Fury is back baseline, and don't ask me why did they make it as a talent in BFA in the first place. Pillar of Frost has been buffed and starts at 20% bonus strength. But I'm not done yet! It has also been removed from the dreaded GCD alongside our Empower Rune weapon, so it's time to pew pew. The Killing Machine passive received a new leveling upgrade, which makes your next obliterate also deal frost damage. While it might seem minor, what it does is that it makes it work with mastery and interact with talent in new ways that we'll get to later on. Now let me present you the new Might of the Frozen Waste passive, which is the current balance design for the 200 vs dual wielding argument. If you choose to wield a two-hander, your obliterate will deal 25% more damage compared to dual wielding, which scales extremely well with the new killing machine passive, making your obliterates, well, uh, finally obliterating. From my testing, it would appear that playing a two-hander is the way to go for PvP, as it enables much stronger hits when having less uptime on your target due to obliterates murdering people, while dual wielding is likely better for higher uptime on targets in PvE, especially for the Breath of Centricosa build in combination with the new rune forging runes Death Knight received. Oh yeah, did I not mention that? After many years left sitting in the dust, behold your new rune forging choices. Sadly, at the moment most of them feel a bit undertuned, which leads to two hunters not having very viable options outside of the usual Razorize for Fallen Crusader, but I'll still make a quick review. The rune of Unending Thirst is definitely viable for ward content as well as leveling given with current values. The spell warding one, even when using its heavy spell damage niche, has a bit low numbers, but would be awesome if you could use it for heavy spell damage encounters or cast for cleave arenas. Sanguination will potentially see play in a tanking spec or some gimmick PvP plays such as battlegrounds for when your healers are not existent. The healing effect cooldown, however, is 5 minutes long, so I don't expect to see it anywhere unless it's going to get buffed. The Rune of Apocalypse is an old unholy artifact trait, which should de facto be the go to PvP rune for an unholy death knight, as those debuffs are actually really strong, but for some reason, are only applied 
fine by your main goal and don't have a big proc rate, making those debuffs never last nor stack and be sadly underwhelming in the end. The only real new winner here is Hysteria, which increases your max runic power by 20, as well as have a chance at granting you a buff of increased runic power generation. This one paired with a breath build and dual wielding is likely going to be very powerful, so let's get to talents. The only real change in them is the new Hypothermic Presence, which reduces the runic power cost of your abilities by 35% for 8 seconds without a GCD, and it very much seems to be designed for a breath build. So what exactly is different this time and isn't noticeable on the first sight? Well, many talents have been slightly buffed. Runic Attenuation has had its RP gain increased to 5 instead of 3, but its proc per minute has been lowered. It should however net more runic power if you were to dual wield. Icecap's cooldown reduction has been buffed to 4 seconds instead of 3, Blinding Sleet has had an added 50% slow for 6 seconds after the effect ends, making it even better for your chill streak combos, and while Death's Advance isn't a talent but a baseline upgrade you get from leveling now, it also has been buffed by increasing its movement speed bonus by 5% and its duration by 2 seconds. Please don't yell at me just because I forgot to mention that earlier. On a final note, while both Glacial Advance and Obliteration didn't get changed, Killing Machine did, thus leading to even stronger frost damage based obliterates on a two-hander paired with Glacial Advance that applies the Razorize Runeforge debuff. Keep that in mind as thanks to new Runeforges being available for dual wielding, playing with Glacial Advance could potentially lead to having three Runeforge effects at the same time. Or you know, you could just make your two-handed obliterate into Armageddon raids. Yeah, right, that wasn't funny. One last thing. As part of the AoE changes that are being applied across all classes and specs in Shadowlands, this is the complete list of the AoE abilities that are receiving a target cap. As you can see for yourself, Frost Death Knights have been largely unaffected by those changes outside of Frost Scythe. What this means is that as long as Blizzard doesn't change that, they might be able to even surpass the BFA King of Heavy AoE being on Holy Decays. But please, don't quote me on that. This is just wishful thinking backed by nothing, as everything is subject to change in terms of numbers. For us there is no peace, no rest. Keep in mind that you'll only be able to equip one legendary effect at a time, but crafting your first one shouldn't take longer than the first reset. I'll do another video about systems and legendaries in Shadowlands before release so it's deemed finalized. Here is the complete list of the legendary effects you will be able to choose from as a Frost Death Knight. The spec specific ones should feel familiar as they come from Legion Legendaries and Knight Hold Steer set as well as a Nazarite trait. Nonetheless, they are pretty cool and should work with various builds depending on the type of content you will be doing. My notable mention is going to be the General Death Knight one being Grip of the Everlasting. For those of you that played in Mists of Pandaria, this was a PvP set bonus that was very powerful and is likely to appear in arenas yet again. You can pair that with a Warrior Spear of Bastion or even your own Necrolord Covenant ability and suddenly nobody gets to escape your grasp anymore, especially with a conduit that stores your target after your grip. You might want to stay alert as the dead are coming to a neighborhood near you. We are driven by a single purpose. Conduits make up for another layer of endgame character progression, but since the general idea is that you're going to be able to pick and choose which one you want to use in your selected soulbind, it should come down to your preferred option. What's likely going to happen is that you'll usually want to take the ones that seem the best, however, don't let that distract you from defensive or utility ones, as they are more often than not extremely powerful for PvP or general utility. As shown on screen, there are three categories of conduits. Potency ones are all about ability throughput, with one of the choices being a covenant ability upgrade, the other two are endurance which is based around increased survivability, and Finesse, which stands for overall utility or movement increases. Keep in mind the amount of which type and how many conduits you'll be able to use is tied to your selected Soulbind talent tree, knowing that when it comes to potency conduits, you'll be able to have a maximum of 3 of them as a trade-off for less Finesse conduits instead. When you just look at them, however, all I can say is that all of the potency ones look very powerful and offer some potential changes to your core rotation, as well as adding more depth into your gameplay, which is, uh, in my opinion, always a welcome addition. Harness your hate. Make it useful. Since Blizzard is most likely not going to change their minds about the possibility of changing Covenant abilities, you, as a player, are going to have to pick one and stick with it. I have created a tier list that can potentially help you in the decision-making process that revolves purely around the performance in all three respective types of endgame content, which are Mythic Plus Dungeons, Arenas, and more single target oriented encounters, which will be named as raids in this review. This tier list will have a point system, on a scale of 1 to 4 in the respective content, as there are, well, 4 covenants to choose from and you will have to pair one against the other, resulting in a decision in the end. One point means likely the worst choice, while 4 means possibly the best one. And now, just a big disclaimer. Tuning isn't final, and likely won't be, even when the game releases, so please, don't murder me in the comments if something happens to change and suddenly Blizzard decides to buff something by 300%. I will surely make an update if that happens. First off, we have Shackle the Unworthy, the current ability on a 1 minute cooldown. 
It applies a dot on your target that lasts 14 seconds and reduces the damage they deal to you by 5%. The important part is that while the dot is active, the cooldown of the ability is reduced by 4 seconds for every rune you spend while it lasts, leading to about 90% uptime at a low level of gear, so a guaranteed 100% uptime once you get some purple equipment. While it is obviously very strong for pure single target encounters, the reason it's also very decent for dungeon is due to the conduit upgrade, making it possible to apply it on more enemies on pretty much every single trash pull pack. For PvP at first, I thought it might be strong as well, but sadly the dot is a magical diva, so it's easily dispellable, making it likely for you to be unable to receive the cooldown reduction from rune spent. Next, we have Abomination Limp, the Necrolord ability on a 2 minute cooldown. When activated, it deals shadow damage to all nearby enemies and most importantly, pulls an enemy to you every 1 second for 12 seconds. While it's about as metal as an ability animation can get, it sadly doesn't do that much in terms of raw numbers at the moment and it's probably going to be outshined by all the choices in both single target and AoE. In PvP however, you can, uh, well, see the potential result in the showcase clip, particularly strong versus casters and healers in 3v3 arenas. Following that, we have Death's Dew, the Night Fae ability on a 30 second cooldown. It upgrades your death and decay ability into a power sucking zone that drains energy from enemies inside it by reducing the damage they do to you and granting you strength for every damage tick it does up to a total of 15%. Even though it has no interaction with the frost DK toolkit in comparison to unholy or blood, it is still very powerful and even on single target, as the buff you get of increased strength lasts 15 seconds but is refreshed and increased every time your zone deals damage, making it last for about 25 seconds even when just facing one enemy, which is honestly way too strong and should be nerfed in my opinion, but we're rating it with current values. For PvP, due to the fact that it's a small zone on the ground, you would think it might be a 1, but due to the amount of slows and grips or roots you can have to use it with, or just pairing it into the popular AoE stun from a monk or the age into a chill streak combo, as well as the damage reduced component has on top, can make your burst setup even stronger. Keep in mind that the PvP ranking in this case is very situational, as it might be very good for 3s, but pretty useless if you have no target lockdown or chill streak setup. Lastly, we have Swarming Mist, the Venthyr ability on a 1 minute cooldown. It's basically a different Remorseless Winter that generates runic power every time it hits a target, up to 15 per target, as well as gives you some dodge as a bonus. While it helps you maintain your breath build and is definitely strong for that, it doesn't give that much runic power on one target, but isn't bad either. Its true power comes in the form of it being uncapped and giving enormous amounts of runic power in AoE scenarios, which makes for a fantastic synergy with a breath build. For PvP, it is also pretty decent if you were to use the Conduit upgrade with it, as it would act as a bonus burst or yet another defensive, because with the max Conduit, the dodge effect is increased to 40% for the first 4 seconds. Now that I've covered them all, you can have a quick look at the total points gathered by all choices, but again, do not take this as something set in stone as nothing is final. Blizzard is trying really hard at making sure that no choice is going to be the best one for everything, or at least that's what they say they are trying to accomplish. Additionally, this list doesn't cover soulbinds and their combination, as they are frankly impossible to cover due to the possibilities being almost endless. My closing words would be that all of the Death Knight Covenant abilities could still get a tuning pass, which would lead to a change in the ranking that I'll update if that happens, as in my opinion, the strength buff and uptime from Night Face just too strong. If it doesn't get nerfed, then it's probably going to be your safe pick, as it works even better with a lot of specs if you ever felt like playing them too. Frostborn hungers. Overall, Frost Death Knights will feel relatively similar to the Legion version, but with added twists and bonuses on top. The possibility of having both dual wield and 200 builds that are viable in different scenarios, as well as obliterates finally doing what their names suggest is something that is very appealing to me. There's honestly nothing bad I can say for Frost DKs. If you enjoyed playing one in Legion or eventually in BFA, you will surely enjoy it more in Shadowlands as it's just bigger and better. However, having said that, it remains a Frost Death Knight, which means their gameplay pace and flow is largely the same but cooler. They're also looking very dangerous in PvP with the amount of burst, sustain damage, survivability, anti-CC and utility they have, as well as potentially very strong in both Raid and Mythic Plus if their toolkit remains uncapped, which sounds fitting for a death-themed expansion. Hail to the king, baby! As an additional selling point, shown on screen were different transmoke sets you'll be able to get in Shadowlands as a Death Knight, courtesy of Lice TV. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to do the whole sub bell thingy everybody asks around, or just share it with others if you want to support me. It actually feels very nice to be appreciated, I'm very grateful for all of your kind words. If you want to hear the full version of the video soundtrack, the link is in the description below. You can also follow me on Twitch or join my Discord if you want to stay updated with what I do and vote on the next video I'll make. Goodbye.